Um, OK, so let's talk about Python. What is Python? Uh, probably all of you know a little bit about Python, right? It's a programming language. Uh, that shouldn't surprise you. And specifically, we could say it's a widely used, very flexible, high-level, general-purpose, dynamic programming language. Right? So that's quite a mouthful. Uh, let's unpack that and take each of these sort of points and, and expand on it a little bit. Um, let me just peek here at the Jupyter. Has anyone, is it coming on for anyone or no? Okay, I hope it's not, uh, yeah, hopefully it didn't die for everyone. Well, we'll make the best of it. Um, uh, it's widely used, so uh, Python is, I think, currently, well, this was true last year, it may not be, these things are, you know, things change. Uh, I think it's the fastest growing major programming language at the moment in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, it's in the top three overall with JavaScript and Java. So here's, this is from last year, but this is, I think, from a, a Stack Overflow survey, and they ask people, you know, what language are you using, or they look at, like, what questions people are asking, and you can see that, like, this, like, amazing rise of Python over the last, like, six or seven years, um, to the point where now, was, I think this is a question views each month, and over 10% of questions now are Python-related. Now, if you're cynical, you might say, well, that's because Python is so bad that everyone needs to ask questions about it, right, and other languages are just perfectly self-explanatory. I don't think that's the case. Actually, if anything, I would say most of, the, most of these other languages are probably actually harder to use, and so you, you might even expect this to be sort of underestimating the, the true impact of Python. But you can see that it's just, just you know, shot off in terms of uh, popularity. Um, and lots of other major languages are sort of fairly static in terms of their use. Um, so it's, it's widely used, which is, which is good, right? Because there's a large community and there's a sort of lots, of lots of tools and lots of people out there that you can draw on when working in Python. Um, it's high level, which is to say Python features a high level of abstraction. Um, lots of operations that you have to very, sort of state very explicitly in lower level languages, things like C, C++, are implicit in Python. So for those of you who have some uh, experience writing C code, where right, to initialize a variable you have to state how much memory you're going to use. And of course you could use too much and then it's inefficient or not enough and then you can have all kinds of errors. You don't need to do any of that in Python. Uh, you also don't need to collect garbage. Once a variable is no longer referenced anywhere, that memory is reclaimed. So there's all kinds of stuff which you, know, you would have to do in lower level languages that just disappears uh, when you're writing Python code. Um, there are trade-offs there. It's not, there are drawbacks to that as well, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, so, but the, the general idea is a high-level language lets you write code faster. And, and in most cases, not all, but probably for most of you most of the time, the bottleneck is not execution speed. It's not that you need the code to run as fast as possible. It's development speed, right? Like if it takes you an hour to write a script and it has to run for a day, that's probably better than having to spend three days writing it and then it runs in like three seconds. Uh, most of the time, we, we, at least in this community, I think, most of us emphasize development speed. And so that's one benefit. And you can see this in practice, that, that Python is just uh, much more terse than many other languages. So here's like one canonical way to read a file in Java. Now I'm cheating a little bit. There's definitely easier ways. But, um, but you know, canonically, if you want to read a file in Java, you have to actually think about every step of the process, right? You have to think of like opening sort of a memory buffer for the content you're going to read it in. Then you actually get the file handle, and so you have to do a lot of work just to get some information in. Uh, whereas in Python, this is the canonical way to read a file. You just say open file name, read, and you get all of the text, assuming it's text, in, in one shot. Um, so that's a dramatic example, but the idea is, in general, you'll end up writing a lot less code if you're writing Python than if you're writing you know, C or, or something like that. Um, Python is a general purpose language. Again, I'm just going to peek over here. Uh, okay, good. There's, looks like something's happening. Um, it's general purpose. You can do almost everything in Python. I, and I only don't say everything just because I'm sure there's, someone's going to find like one thing that Python just is really bad at. But you can do almost everything you need to in Python. Um, it has a a really comprehensive standard library. I'll come back to this, meaning out of the box, Python has modules for just about everything you could imagine. Um, and on top of that, it has an enormous ecosystem of third-party packages. So if it's not there out of the box, it probably is like one short Google search away, and you'll find a pretty good package to do what you want. Um, it's also very widely used in many areas of software development. So it's not just data science, although it's super widely used in data science. Uh, DevOps, right? so administering systems uh, and automating things. Uh, web development for the back end. Um, so obviously one place where you don't find Python yet uh, is on the front end in browsers because only JavaScript and various languages that transpile to JavaScript currently run in the browser. That may change in the next few years. Um, um, oops. 
Uh, so, so it's general purpose, which again is nice because if, if, if you intend to do more than just uh, uh, data analysis, like let's say maybe you want to write a web app and throw up some, some of the stuff you've generated, you can do that in Python. You don't have to switch to another language. And that cognitive cost of switching between languages can be fairly painful. Uh, Python is dynamic, which is to say, uh, well, dynamic is sort of a vague term, but like one of the things people mean when they say language dynamic typically is that it's interpreted, meaning when you write that code, um, you have an interpreter that starts basically reading it line by line and executing it. Um, there is no compilation process. That's not entirely true. There's actually, you can have, I mean, this is a matter of implementation. So there are actually Python um, um, uh, compilers. But in general, if you install Python, um, or if it comes with your, with your operating system, it's generally, you can think of it as, as, as an interpreter that just reads line by line. Uh, figures out what you're trying to do and executes that, that line then and there, which means there isn't this sort of five minute compilation process um, every time you, you, you want to make a small change. So this is nice in some ways because it eliminates the delay between develop and execution, right? It's very fast, you can just hit like run, see what happens. Um, there is a downside. You generally get poor performance compared to compiled languages, and there are lots of errors you can catch when you have a, a compiler that will be missed by um, the Python interpreter. So it's not, again, like there's always trade-offs. Uh, but again, like if, if you're in an environment where your goal is really to iterate rapidly and, 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 and you value developer time more than execution time, that's generally a, a good trade to make, I would say. Um, okay, any questions about about so that kind of stuff, just sort of like big picture. What is Python? Where does it fit into the general space of, of uh, programming languages? Okay, is Zupyter up for everyone? Okay, good. So, uh, assuming you're seeing this, you should be able to uh, click on this Jupyter notebook. This will come up, and then you can follow along. Um, let me just so that you can actually, if you haven't seen, well, actually, let me ask: How many people? Can, are familiar with if familiar enough with the Jupyter notebook to like execute code in a cell. Okay, so about half. Okay, so let me spend a few minutes here. So um, the idea here, and I'll come back to this. And actually, if you're new to this, I definitely recommend uh, going to Elizabeth's talk uh, tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow because she'll talk. She'll spend a whole hour on Jupyter. Um, this is an interactive notebook. Again, I'll defer what exactly that means. Just know that you have these cells, and some of them have code. And if you click in them, uh, you can run them. So actually, we should run the one up. Oh, no, there's one up top, never mind. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you click on this, you can hit this play button here, and that'll actually execute it. You could also hit control enter or shift enter, which does the same thing. And this is executing, essentially, this is like having a, 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 a shell, right, where you're like in a, in a Jupyter, uh, in a Jupyter, uh, sorry, in an IPython or just interactive uh, Python shell. And so, um, that command is actually executing. Now you don't see anything happen because all we've done is assign a variable, so there won't be any output. But just to kind of make the point, right, if I were to run that, it spits out what, the, the, you know, what you just asked it to print. And so as I'm going through, you're welcome to kind of run each cell as I go through it. Um, one thing I would actually recommend you do uh, is probably, um, Clear cells here. Oh, here we go. Oh, so I'm used to the Jupyter Notebook, and this is Jupyter Lab, which is a little different. Does anyone know off the top of your head how you clear cells here? All right, well, no big deal. Um, just so that you don't kind of see the, the output in advance, but it doesn't really matter. Um, all right, so let me go on. So let's talk a little bit about the actual sort of the, the, the language itself. Uh, and again, I'm assuming that. Everyone in this room uh, is familiar with you know, the idea of a variable. And if you're not, that's fine. Just you know, I'm going to have to make certain assumptions uh, to keep things moving. Um, um, every language has its own sort of view, philosophy, or implementation of sort of what the, if you like, the core data types are, right? So things like integers, floats, et cetera. Um, and Python is no different. And uh, variables are obviously super important in every language. In Python, like in many, many other languages, we declare a variable by assigning it a value with the equal sign. Um, one thing I will mention, if, if this doesn't make any, any sense to you, don't worry about it, but for people who uh, are familiar with sort of, uh, um, um, sort of copying by reference versus value, variables in Python are pointers, which is to say when you, um, in fact, let me, oops. Sorry. Let me 
me just pop out of here. So if we have a cell, um, there's a code cell. So when I do, you know, um, something like this, right? I say fruit equals apple. The variable name is fruit. That's a pointer, meaning it's not actually, don't think of it as like a bucket of memory where I'm putting the content in the apple in there. This is actually just a pointer. It's just essentially like, like almost like a, a sticker you put on uh, some object. And so somewhere in memory you have the string apple and fruit just happens to be pointing there. It's not like a bucket that actually contains information. Um, and that, I think I'll come back to that, that has actually some interesting implications because when you do things like, you know, this, right, so if I initialized a variable called fruit and then I did, this is actually a bad example, let's talk about, I'll talk, explain what a list is in a second. Let's say I have a list with the numbers one, two, three. My three key doesn't work, so it's going to be four. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and then I assign another variable and point to the same thing, right? Intuitively, you might think one of two things will happen. One is this actually gets copied. So there's a copy of this list created and it's assigned here. And so now you have two lists. And that's the model you would have if you think of this as like the variable is a bucket. So fruit is like one bucket with, with information one, two, four. Other fruit is a different bucket with values one, two, four, right? If that were true, then when we change, when we do something like this, if we were to say other fruit, if we, if we add a value, so we append, let's say five to this, right? Now the cool question is what, if I, if I then print fruit, what is the value of fruit gonna be? People have intuitions? There's sort of two intuitions you could have, and it, there's no right or wrong here, it's just a question of how the language is implemented. Right, so let's, let me just again make clear what we did. We initialized this variable, right, it has this value, and then we said, oh hey, initialize another variable, other fruit, and basically point to the same, the same data as fruit was pointing to. And now we take the second one and we add a value to this, so we're just gonna add a five here. And now I'm just gonna look at what's in fruit. What do people think is gonna happen there? Okay, so yeah, so one intuition is one, two, four. Why? Because, right, so if you have this mental model that variables are buckets, then this step actually created a separate bucket, right? It's basically, this was saying copy this value and create, right? And then when we modify it over here, we're not modifying the original. So that's a perfectly reasonable intuition. That's how some languages behave. That's actually not how Python behaves. Python variables are pointers. So when you do this, you're actually saying, hey, other fruit is pointing to the same place in memory, right? So neither of these is actually a bucket by itself. There's some place in memory that has this variable sitting there, and these are, or the, and that piece of information, and both of these now, fruit and other fruit, are both pointing to the same object. So if you modify one, you're actually gonna modify the other. Okay, That's a, that can be a little bit counterintuitive. I'm just kind of giving you a, a kind of a, a sense of, of um, the behavior you see. Um, I will also say that's not true for all data types. So if I had done that with a string, so if I'd said, uh, you know, fruit equals uh, mango, and then assign another variable, um, then what I just showed you would not be true because, because um, sort of basic data types are copied when you sort of reassign. Again, that's a subtle point, and you, you know, I bring it up only because you may run into this at some point and not understand what's going on, so just be aware that there is this issue you might have to think about. Um, if that didn't make a whole lot of sense, don't worry about it, right? It's not that common a, a, a thing to run into. So let's go back and talk about the, the basic types. Um, Uh, so the Jupyter Notebook is wonderful, but slide mode sometimes has some problems. Oops. Well, you know what, let me just... It's, where is it? Ah, okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, so if you don't want to have all the answers there, you can go to edit, clear all outputs, and then you'll have to run the cell in order to see what, uh, what, what happens. Um, okay, so let's talk about the, the basic types in Python, assuming that I can actually get this thing to operate. There we go. Um, all right, so um, as in most languages, right, pretty much every programming language is gonna have a data type called an integer, which is essentially a number, or an integer, whole number. Um, so here's how you would uh, assign a, 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 an integer in Python. You just variable name equals and then whatever the value is. Notice the, the variable naming convention here. Right? So um, nothing about Python prevents you from creating a variable like this and it'll work just fine. This is a naming convention. There's a nice document 
uh, out there which people tend to follow that has uh, lots of style conventions. And it's generally good practice to follow the style conventions because it makes your code more readable, people understand it more easily. Um, convention says for variables, you name them with this kind of, uh, this kind of convention, this is called snake case. So it's all, on, all lowercase letters, you never have uppercase, and you separate words with underscores. Right, so this, is, this would be sort of um, conventional way to name variables, not this or some language, which other languages will do. So again, but again, if you, if you mess this up, don't worry. Your code will write fine. It's just a convention. Um, okay, so that's how you initialize an integer. Oops. Um, what about a float? So here is initializing a float. We could say, um, you know, what's this variable called? Almost pi. And notice that you know it's a float. You don't have to, to define the, the, and I'll come back to this in a sec. You don't have to define the type, right? We do, we're not saying like agent years is an integer explicitly. That's inferred from the fact that, that it's a, just a number with no decimal. If you have a decimal, then it's inferred that it's a float, right? Uh, string, same thing. We don't have to tell Python, oh, b banana we're initializing as a string. It knows it's a string because it's, it's in quotes. And so that's going to be uh, stored internally as a string. Um, a Boolean, hopefully uh, you're mostly familiar with Booleans, right? Booleans only take on the values true or false. Are you enjoying the tutorial? Hopefully the answer is yes, so we'll store that, right? True. There is this one curious thing in Python that not all languages have, uh, which is something called none. None is a special type, uh, and you can think of it as, as sort of being a way to say that there's actually no value. So let's say we have a variable name, and maybe it's like tracking some user's name and nothing has been entered, so we might initialize it to none, which is to say like, you know, there's supposed to be something here at some point, but not, no values in past. This is not the same as false, okay? So um, none is, does not mean the same as false, and if you need evidence of that, you can ask, is none equal to false? And that will evaluate, and the answer is no, it's false, right? These are not the same thing. Um, okay. Uh, so if you ever see this, just be aware that's what that means. It's sort of a placeholder. Um, functions, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment, typically, well, not typically, often you'll give functions a return value explicitly, but if you don't, then functions in Python will always return none. Now, you, that doesn't mean you have to care about that, right? Typically you don't, um, but if you assign the, return, the, the value returned from a function to a variable and no, no value is actually returned within the function, it will actually be none. Um, Again, not super important to, to know that, but just be aware that, that every function in Python uh, implicitly has a return value, and it's not if you don't set it to something else. Any questions about data types or sort of basic data types in Python? Again, feel free to ask questions at any point. I don't, I don't think we're in danger of running out of time. Um, okay. All right. So those are sort of, you can think of them as, as like basic types, right? And, and there's a subtlety there I'll come back to. Uh, they're actually not really basic in Python, uh, and I'll talk about that. But in most languages, when you talk about things like integers, floats, those are, you can think of those like primitive types, right? They're sort of built into the language. You don't have, you can't modify them. You know, you, they already exist uh, for your benefit. Uh, most of the things you'll want to do, though, involve something more than just strings and integers, right? You typically will want to use structures that are built up out of these things. Most code, and certainly data analysis code, requires more complex structures than just strings, ints, floats, booleans, etc. Um, and so we can start to talk about containers or collections. So these are like compound objects, in a sense, that are made up out of the things I just showed you. And Python provides built-in support for many common structures. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. There's many others you can find in the collections module, uh, which is part of the standard library. I think I'll touch on that in a, in a bit. Uh, okay. So lists are an obvious one. Uh, if you're coming from, let's say, R or many other languages, uh, lists are usually referred to as arrays. Right, so if, you, if you've seen like arrays in other languages, um, that's roughly what you're talking about when you talk about a list. It's an ordered heterogeneous collection of objects. Uh, what do I mean by heterogeneous? Anybody? I can hear mumbling, but you have to speak up a little bit. Yes, right, so the elements of a list can have different data types. I'll show you that in a second. Um, so it's really just a collection of different objects. It could be anything at all. Uh, list elements can be accessed by position, right? So typically, you want to be able to get certain pieces of information out of that list. And so let's initialize a, a list called random stuff, and we'll just fill it with stuff. So let's add the number 11, um, um, apple, uh, 
three point, well, I can't do three. 7.14 is our, is our bastardized pi because I can't type a three. I can't type a three, but it takes me a little while, yeah? Yes, yeah, good question, yeah. So yeah, so Python does not distinguish between these two things, that's fine. And that's actually quite useful because it allows you to do things like this, right? So you can have quotes within a string as long as they're different quotes. Now, you could also have the same kind of quote and then uh, if you're familiar with escaping characters, right? So, so you, this is another way, like if you need to quote within a string, then you could also do this. And the backslash character in Python, as in most languages, uh, means escape. So it's basically say, interpret the next character literally, right? Because if you didn't have that, what would happen, right, is it would, it would think that you opened a string and then you immediately closed it because it's the very next character. And that says, no, interpret the next thing literally. Interpret it as, a, as a, another part of the string. Um, but that's a good question, yeah. In general, I mean, people have preferences. I don't think, I don't remember off the top of my head, I don't think this, the, the convention, the style guide says anything about this except in doc strings, which are in functions, I think you're supposed to use double quotes. But this is a pretty trivial thing. I don't think anyone will get mad at you if you use one or the other. So you do whatever you prefer. Um, okay, so we have our, our list here. It has three elements, and notice it's heterogeneous, right? They're not all integers uh, or any particular type. This is an integer, this is a string, this is a float. So we'll run that, and now we have our, um, our random stuff list. Okay, I mentioned that we can, we can uh, access specific uh, elements, so we're not sort of stuck just using this as a whole or maybe we can only access, there are data structures you can only access from the front or from the end. Um, we have random access to this list. We can say, hey, I want to access the, the first, or sorry, the, the, let's say the second element, and the way I would do that is as follows, right? So that would give you the second element. Now, this is a point of contention sometimes, right? If you're familiar with R, I should have asked, how many people are familiar with R? Okay, yeah, so lots of R. R indexes from one, right? So this would, in R, give you the first element. Uh, in Python and in many other programming languages, uh, this in indexing starts from zero, so this would be the second element. You can think of it as the, the, the nth, right? So the zeroth element is actually the first one, uh, and so on. And I don't want to start a, 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 like a war over like whether you should index from zero or one. People have strong opinions. It does not matter at all. You're stuck with it, whether you like it or not. Every language makes a choice one way or the other. Just be aware that indexing in Python starts from one. And so if you're like porting code from R, you know, naively, you just want to make sure anytime you're indexing into a, a data structure like a list, you want to make sure that you remember that you have to start at zero. Uh, so in this case, if we ran, oh, oops, not random, random stuff. So if we uh, ask for the one element, we get back apple. Right? We could have done zero and then we get 11 and so on. So that's useful because now you have basically a, a, a structure you can use to store arbitrary kinds of information. And as long as you know the position, the index, you can always get back just that one specific chunk of information. You don't have to go through the entire list and check each one and say, is this an apple? Ah, good. Um, we can also slice lists. So often, uh, let's add maybe, um, right, we, we can also take, get a chunk or a subset of that list. So we can say, uh, give me the elements starting at the one position and going all the way through to fourth. And um, this is exclusive, right? So it won't include this. So this will be the fifth element. It will not include them. There isn't a fifth element in any case, but it wouldn't, won't include it. So this is saying start at position one and give me all the elements until but not including the fourth element, or the, sorry, at position four, the fifth element. And so now you have a, a subset of that list, or a slice, which is often very useful, especially when you're doing data analysis, right? You might have reason to think, I only want the data at this part of the list. Uh, any questions about lists? All right. Um, now lists have all kinds of, of uh, methods, all kinds of things you can do with a list. And just as an aside, if you ever want to know for any, any object in Python at all what it can do, uh, you can use this function dir um, on anything, and that will show you what, what you can do with that object. So there's lots of stuff that, you know, and don't worry about these underscore, funny underscore ones, I'll, I'll talk about those in a bit. Um, but here are all the things that you can ask a list to do. You can append to it, you can clear, copy, count, extend. These are all methods implemented in that list object. The same thing goes for what I called, you know, basic data types earlier. So if you want to know, like, like what an integer like six can do, same thing. So now you have all these things. Um, and notice that most of these are, again, these funny double underscore things, and I'll explain what, what those are shortly. Um, but in this case, 
Um, uh, I'll just tell you that if you want to add an element to a list, then you can just append. And so we can say, uh, you know, add the number 88, maybe. And, and so now if we look at the list after that append, now, we've add, now we have five elements, right? Um, okay, so nothing, nothing you know, terribly exciting here, but this is sort of basic stuff that is going to be really important uh, when you're writing Python code. And you pretty much guarantee you'll be doing this kind of stuff over and over and over. Um, I will mention something that you may not have seen if you are coming from a different language, which is the tuple. Tuples are, you can think of them as almost lists. They're very, very similar to lists. The key difference is tuples are immutable. What does that mean? It means that once you've created a tuple, you cannot modify it. So you notice, saw how I just appended to the list, right? I, and that, that's basically saying that you know I created a list, and then after it was created, I could still go back and add stuff to it. I can remove stuff to it. A tuple, once initialized, cannot be modified. Um, so, and you also initialize them to distinguish tuples from from um, from lists. You initialize them with parentheses and not brackets. So uh, I could do something like this. Um, I could say you know my tuple, and it has. Uh, again, can be heterogeneous, right? And so I'm assigning this, th this value to the tuple, but now if I were to do something like this, let's say I decide afterwards, oh, I want to append another, I want to append the value one, that is going to fail. The tuple doesn't know what appending means. Um, there's no such thing. You can slice it the same way, you can access it, but you cannot modify it in any way. And so one use for tuples, and so you might ask, well, why have this structure that's basically like lists? It's almost identical. Well, often, for example, we want to do things like initialize a, a, a bunch of parameters and pass them around, but you don't want people to mess with them. Right? So you don't want people to accidentally overwrite any of these values. And so this is just a nice way to have a structure that behaves exactly like a list, but cannot be modified for, by anyone for any reason once you've created it. That can actually be quite handy. Um, but if you, you know, you, you, it's perfectly fine if you just use lists everywhere, at least until you're fairly experienced and nothing bad will happen, or it, it's unlikely that something bad will happen. Um, the other really, really common structure, so lists are extremely common. The other structure that's really common is a dictionary. And um, in other languages, these still be referred to as hash tables, associative arrays. So if you have any programming experience in another language, you've certainly seen these, right? So in Python, uh, we call them dictionaries. They're unordered collections of key to value pairs. And dictionary elements can be accessed by key, but not by position. They're unordered. A list has an order, right? If you create it in a certain order, um, then you want to access the third element, then it's always going to be, the, you, know, you, you, you can always access something by the particular position. That's a, a meaningful concept. Dictionaries, there's no concept of uh, order. Um, there's actually some subtlety there, but you can, you can think of it as being unordered. So here's how you initialize a dictionary. Uh, the convention here, the, the syntax for creating a dictionary uses these uh, squiggly braces. Uh, let's say I have my dictionary called fruit prices, and I can have arbitrary key value pairs. So the key is apple in this case, and I'm setting the value 65, or 65 cents, let's say, mango, uh, 150, strawberry, I maybe I want to have a string there, so it's $3 a pound, uh, and you can't get durians, right, right now at least. Uh, okay, so that's our dictionary, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, initialize that. Um, alternative th way you could actually do the same exact thing, just, just as an aside, you could also do this. So if, if people have preferences, right, if you prefer uh, typing this, this is an equally good way, it does exactly the same thing. So, and this is true of Python to, to a fair extent. It's not quite as pathological as R in flexibility. R will let you do like everything in like 15 different ways, which is, you know, depending on your perspective, either great or like awful. Uh, Python is more principled, but there still are generally you know, multiple ways to do many things. Um, we initialize this dictionary, and now if we want to access the values, right, we do that by key, so uh, we can say fruit prices, and I want to look up the value of a mango, or the price of a mango, and notice I'm doing that by key, right, and I get back the value. Now, I mentioned that, that, that dictionaries are unordered, there's no concept of index, so you might think, well, you know, Apple was the first pair I put in, so I should be able to ask for the first value. I should be able to say, like, give me the zeroth value. That does not work. No concept of order. What you can do is you can ask for a list of the values. I could say, give me all the values as a list. However, you are not guaranteed that the order will respect the order you typed it in. So um, depending on the implementation, I think in Python 3 it actually is kind of true. Oops. 
but you shouldn't you shouldn't bank on it, right? So you cannot assume that if you, just because you ask for the values and you get back as a list that this order will reflect that. So just a good idea not to not to think that dictionaries have any kind of order. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right. Uh, adding uh, values to a dictionary, adding key value pairs, is sort of follows the same syntax. Um, Let's say we wanted to add the price of, um, uh, I don't know, an orange. Right, so now we've added that to our dictionary. Right, so we're straightforward. Um, OK, questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want uh, the, in the in dictionary. Oh, you mean like in the list? Uh, so there's no in 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 sort of in sort of pure Python. There's well, there is a very convoluted way to do it, which I won't show you. But you can do that much more easily in, in NumPy, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Uh, but it's a good question. But no, so yeah, like it, it'd be a little difficult to do this without using objects called slices in Python. But of course, what you can do is you know the way I would do that probably uh, is just something like let's say we have our we have our random stuff list. Let's say you want to get the second and fourth element. What you could do is you could say um, subset equals, you could do something like this. Um, right, so that's one way to, to go about that. Um, yeah. uh, in NumPy, you can index sort of arbitrary chunks of things much more easily. I see, yeah, so the reason for that is, let's, uh, let's say I do something like that, oops. So that's, the reason for that is because, it's, it's not, yeah, so I'm glad you brought this up, so this is interesting. Right? So um, remember that the, this is not included. Right? So what you're getting back is the subset that starts here and then stops here, but does not include that. Why do you have the comma? Because this is a tuple, and the reason is, it's basically for, it's to make it clear, right? So because the problem is if you didn't have the parentheses and the comma, you might think that's just an in integer, and it's not. And so that's why. There's another common gotcha in Python. There are not that many gotchas in Python, but one of them is uh, sometimes you'll do something like this. You'll say, you know, let's say you have a string. If you do this, let me comment this out. That's going to be stored as a string. So you can see this by asking, you know, what is the type of this thing? Okay, that's a string. However, often you'll actually want to initialize a tuple with only one element, and so that comma would make all the difference. Right? So that's a, a gotcha that you may, it, it, you probably won't run into it anytime soon, but it can happen, right? And then, I, like this has happened to me where I thought I was creating a tuple and actually I created a string because I forgot this little comma. So that, that you know, so there's a, a little, there's a few things like that, but not, not too many. Uh, yeah, so that's why you see that. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. How to what? How to add something. Yes, sure. So um, uh, in the case of lists, uh, yeah, so, you, so for tuple, you, you wouldn't be able to add anything. For lists, you have an append uh, method, and then you just pass a single value, and it would add it to the end. Um, if you wanted to add another list, there's an extend method, so you could do something like this, and that expects a list. So um, you could say, you know, extend random stuff with another list that has maybe the values one, two, and eight, and that would tack on, it's basically concatenation. So that would sort of take the first list and add the second list right at the end. Uh, and there's various other things you can do with lists. So you can ask for the length, for example. Um, if, you know, for these kind of things, if you just Google working with lists, you'll probably get a bunch of tutorials. And let me actually mention, I was, I think I have a link at the end. Um, I think my favorite book, which I would recommend you to read if you're new to Python, is this one, uh, as, a, as an introductory book by Jake Vanderplas. Uh, I don't think we mentioned it. Jake actually was at the eScience Institute until this last year. Now he's at Google, which is unfortunate for us because he actually did the machine learning tutorial that I will now have to do, and so I'm a little apprehensive about that because um, but it really does fantastic, beautiful work, and, and so pretty much any time you see something by Jake, you, you know it's gonna be really good. Um, and so if you wanna know more about sort of working with different uh, data types, I, I think that's, that would be a good place to, to go. Um, 
I'll also mention again that you can, you can always ask, um, you can do the following. You can ask, well, what can I do with this list? And you can kind of look down, and then you kind of often, depending on how much programming experience you have, you'll get sort of an intuitive sense of what these are doing just from the names. So, for example, I can tell you, like, index, if you, uh, index will give you the first, the, the, or the index or the position of the first element in the list that matches the argument, right? So I could do something like, uh, let's say I know that the list contains Apple somewhere, but I don't remember where, so I can say, what is the index of Apple? And it'll say it's at position one. Right? Um, another helpful thing in the Jupyter Notebook, you might think, well, okay, that's great, if, you know, but I, I don't, you know, I don't, maybe I don't have that much programming experience. I'm not going to know what append int intuitively means. Um, and so one thing that's nice is you can, um, in the Jupyter Notebook, and I'll come back to this as well, you can type just the name of the method and then hit, oops, sorry, hit uh, shift tab. So if you're inside the, the signature here, the parentheses, you can hit shift tab, and then you can bring up help if you want. Now in this case, this is not super helpful at all, actually. It doesn't tell you anything. And that's because for like the very, very basic stuff, I guess they have been bothered to document, which is probably not great. So ignore what I just said. That's not gonna help you at all in this case. But in the general case, there are ways to look up help um, uh, for what different functions do. Uh, other questions? Okay. Uh, now, I've been lying to you a little bit, right? So I, I've been talking about like other basic data types and then there's like data structures, which is actually a fabrication because ultimately in Python, everything is an object. There is actually no, there are very subtle distinctions, but there's not really a, 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 a big distinction between like a core data type like an integer and uh, like a, a, a different, like a, some complex object that you might create. Everything in Python is ultimately just an object. And the operations you can perform with a variable, including things like addition, subtraction, right, in the case of, of uh, uh, numeric data types, depends on the object's definition. So for example, you might think of like multiplication as some basic, basic operation, basic arithmetic operation that's built into the language. Uh, and that would be true in some languages. In Python, it's actually not true. Uh, multiplication is actually a method, or you can think of it as a property, a, a feature of an object. And so somewhere in the Python code base, uh, there's something called an integer is defined, and it basically, in that piece of code, it also says that here's, like a, here's how you know, multiplication and addition would work. All right, so I'll show you that in a moment, um, but let me just kind of show from like the output side what I mean. So um, multiplying by an integer is not, nothing here will surprise you, right? So if I do this, what am I gonna get? Eight, right, no surprise there, okay. Uh, semantics for, for, for multiplication for integers are very clearly understood. If a language didn't give, and give you an aid, you would probably back away slowly and say, well, maybe I should just stay with R, right? Um, how about multiplication? Well, you know, if, again, same kind of idea, right? So if I multiply 11.1 uh, by 2, what am I going to get? 22.2, right? No surprises. All right, but now it gets interesting. Like, what is the semantics of multiplication for strings? So. Um, if you have the answer in front of you and the, the don't, you don't, you know, you're not allowed to, to, to speak, but, but just intuitively, right? So if I said this, what do you think will happen? And there's, I mean, again, there's no right answer. Like, if you didn't know anything about the language or how it was implemented, you could come up with several plausible suggestions. And I think depending on how you went about implementing the language, they would all be fine. So what would you expect to happen here? What are we going to see? Okay, so that's, yeah, so one intuition is apple, apple, right? So this is basically gonna double the string. Any other ideas? Yeah. Get an error, right? Yeah, so exactly. It could be that, like, that's just not something you should be able to do with a string, right? Any other ideas? I mean, those are probably the two, the two sort of common intuitions. But, so in this case, the first one is right. But I just wanna make the point, right? That nothing about, there's nothing intrinsic to multiplication that says that it should be illegitimate for Apple or that it should give you this answer. It's a choice that somebody made that that's how the semantics of multiplication are defined for strings. Um, and I'll show you shortly how they're actually defined. Okay, what about a list? So we have a random stuff list. What if I multiply that by two? Any intuitions? Okay, print the list twice. Um, alternatively, you could have also gotten an error. You could imagine, right? So one intuition you might have is maybe it depends on the contents of the list, right? So if you're coming from like R, a numerical, oriented language, right? If you had something like this, you might expect this would give you back 2, 4, 12, because it's actually doing element-wise multiplication on an array, a numerical array. Uh, but as it happens in this case, the first intuition is right. You basically get the same list uh, uh, twice. So I kept appending. That's why we have all those 88s there. But, um, right, but it does the same thing as for strings. So at least that's sort of internally consistent. Um, what about dictionaries? 
What happens if I try to multiply our fruit prices dictionaries by two? Any intuitions? Well, could you, could you, I mean, would it make any sense to, to sort of double the length of that dictionary? No, right? The reason it doesn't is because keys are unique in a dictionary, so it's not obvious what that would mean. Like, you couldn't just do sort of the naive thing you're doing here and, like, add an extra set of the same uh, entries because uh, keys have to be unique in a dictionary. And so in this case, you do get an error. And it tells you that's an unsupported uh, operand type for the multiplication. You basically can't take a dictionary and multiply it by an int. The dictionary object does not define multiplication, right? So that doesn't work. Um, Okay, I'll come back in a second. So this, I'm just kind of pointing this out that, that you, know, you don't know what the semantics are until you learn the language, right? And every language behaves slightly differently. Um, but I will show you sort of where that's defined and it's, it's much more principled and kind of elegant, I think, than you might think. The way you would get a value out of a dictionary is like that. So the square brackets and then the name of the key where the value is stored. So that would be basically saying, uh, hey, fruit prices dictionary, what value do you have stored at Apple? And there's the value. If you typed something that doesn't exist, right, so if you said, you know, give me the value of that key, you'd get a key error saying nothing's there. Um, the way you set a value is very, very similar. You basically just say, um, I want to, basically, you can think of this as like pointing to a particular key in that dictionary, and, and instead of just saying, hey, what's there, you're now saying set this to a new value, and so I could say it's no longer 0.65, now we're going to set it to 70, right? So that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, other questions? anything? Okay. All right, let's go on then. Uh, let's talk about control structures. So control structures are super important. They're language features that allow us to control how code is executed. Right? So um, it would be a really bad world, or at least a very difficult world uh, to live in if the only way you could execute code was you start at line one and then you go to line two and then you go to line three and you just have to have a completely linear uh, piece of code, right? And you can never sort of call things out of order. That would be very, very complicated. You'd have to duplicate code a lot, etc. So control structures are basically sort of language constructs or language features that let you control how the code is actually executed. So uh, things like for loops, while statements, right? Iteration, where you're doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, conditionals, which you're pretty much guaranteed to have seen if you have spent um, uh, a little while programming in other languages, right? So if then else statements, if something is true, do this, otherwise do some other thing. And so there's a, there's a few control structures. Those are sort of the big ones, uh, but there's others. I'm just linking here to the, the documentation for control structures in Python. Uh, the really the important ones are like for loops and, and if then else statements conditionals. So just to kind of illustrate, um, in Python, the, the syntax for if else statements look like looks like this. So we might say, um, so remember that that fruit price dictionary we have, right? So let's say that we we want to do different things depending on what the price of a mango is. So um, so we can say if well, let's actually just for to reduce the amount of typing I have to do, let's assign uh, this mango price value to a variable called mango, and then I'll have to keep typing fruit prices, square bracket, et cetera, every time. So now I can say if mango is less than, uh, let's say, you know, 0.5, let's print, mangoes are super cheap, get a bunch of them, okay. Otherwise, I use my rationalizing system to say, meh, I don't really even like mangoes, not interested. Um, okay, so now here we have the, the value from the dictionary assigned to the mango, and so now what's going to happen, right, if the value is below 0.5, this will get executed, otherwise this will get executed, um, right? So in this case, it's pricier than my cutoff. Uh, now, in Python, now, so that works fine if you have just sort of two, two sort of branches, right? But what happens if you have others? So you have multiple conditions you want to evaluate. Uh, so in Python, that looks like this. You have elif which is short for else if, right? So if the mango price is below 0.05, we do that. Uh, else if, or if mango price is below you know, one, uh, print get one mango from the store. Otherwise, right, then the price is really absurd if it's more than a dollar. So very basic stuff, but super important. 
uh, and that's what it looks like in Python. Now, depending on what languages you're familiar with, if any, you probably are familiar with like like switch statements, um, right? Where you sort of have it really it's just shorthand for so you have like something it would look like. I mean, this won't work obviously; it's not valid Python. But you might have a language that has something like switch mango, uh, and then you know if the value is less or less than 0.5, do something. And it's just a, a shorter way to write this. Python does not have switch statements. So if you do have a bunch of conditionals, you are going to have to write out, you know, if this, then, elif, and so on. Um, uh, so that's, you know, there's, that's, that's one, one downside. Having said that, one thing that's really nice about Python, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, and you can see this here, it's a super readable language, right? It almost reads like English in many cases. Like, it's very clear. You don't need all kinds of parentheses. So like in like JavaScript and other languages, you would have to have like all these characters, right? And it's just more typing and it reduces clarity. Um, I, I find it really easy to read Python code um, because a lot of the, the terms you'll see are basically English. So if you have multiple conditions, you can say and. So if mango is less than 0.5, and I don't remember what else we have in our uh, in our dictionary, but let's say we had like apple, right? We do have apple, I think, right? And apple is greater than, right? And so it's, it's readable. Um, and the other thing I, I, I'll mention at this point, you'll notice the indentation, right? So notice that inside this, this if statement, we have to go down, we have to indent. That is not optional. So unlike many languages, um, Python forces you to use uh, what's called semantic white space. White space has meaning. In many languages, you could just do, you could put all this on one line if you want. Uh, in Python, this, this will actually work, so there are some constraints on that. But in general, you are strongly encouraged, and to some degree, you have to use indentation. Um, and the reason for that is to force you to, to basically enforce code clarity. So this is something that, that many people hate when they come from other languages because it feels constraining. Like, why do I have to like, you know, indent every time I go down another level? And the same would be true if you had another conditional. Like, so if in here you had um, something like this, uh, then now you have to go down another level, right? And so on. And so you have this sort of you keep sort of indenting over and over. But the answer is it makes it very clear what sort of how deep you are. And, and when you, in languages you don't have this enforced, some people are good about enforcing code clarity, so it's not a problem. But many people will sort of start to build these really long, quote unquote, one liners, which really just means you have like a whole script on one line and it, it gets just very ugly very quickly. Yeah? That depends on your on your uh, on your ID or your editor, basically. So uh, in in uh, in the Jupyter Notebook, it won't, well actually does it do that automatically? It might. Let me see. Yeah, it does. Okay. So, but it's not. I mean, that's not part of the language. That's if you're using a modern editor, most of them will do that, and they're fairly clever about that. So if it's like an if statement or a for, they'll usually pop you down in, indented. If your editor doesn't do that, there might be a cue that maybe you should look for a different editor, right? So like if you're using like Notepad in Windows. I would say maybe explore VS Code or Sublime Text or something like that. Uh, again, I think that will depend probably. I'm sure you can turn it on or off, and you can set the, the, the number of characters, et cetera. I will also mention that Python doesn't, like, it doesn't mandate how much indentation you do. So like, I think the default, and the, the recommendation is four, but you could decide that you want to indent everything like two, and then you just have to be consistent. So this will also be fine. Right? And that's something you can set in an editor. The style guide does suggest four, or like a tab. Um, anyway, so but the original point I wanted to make here is just like this is what this is what a, a, a conditional statement looks like in in uh, Python. Any questions? Okay. Um, the other major control structure that you see everywhere uh, is the loop, the for loop. And so let's take let's remind ourselves we have this. Uh, let's you know let's get rid of all those just because. It's it bothering me. Let's just take the, uh, we'll just slice up to one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So we'll just set random stuff to the slice of random stuff up to the sixth element. And now we've gotten rid of those. Um, oh, ah. I'm not good at counting. There we go. Oops. All right, now we, we only have the one value there. Um, okay, so let's say we want to loop over, we, we have something that we want to do for every element in the list. And this is super common, right, to, to have like some data structure and you want to iterate 
through. It could be, if you have a dictionary, maybe it's key value pairs. If you have a list, typically it'll be sort of one element at a time. And so you have a for loop. And again, the syntax is really, I think, quite uh, simple and elegant in Python. It's basically for blah in blah. And so we could say for, um, let's call it element. This is arbitrary, but we can say for element in uh, random stuff. Print the value is. Okay. And if we run that, we're just going to get something that looks like that. So very simple. And again, it's, it's human like, right? You can read this for element in random stuff, and you can get the semantics fairly intuitively. Take that random stuff list, and for every thing, which we're naming element internally for each one, do something. And again, you'll notice the indentation. Um, there are variations on this. So for example, one thing that's often very useful, often you want to know not just, you don't just want the value, you also want to know what the position is. So one thing you can do is use Python's built-in enumerate method. And um, now, so now this is a little more complex. Notice what we're doing here is we're asking, so enumerate will give you back in every iteration, it'll give you back two things. One is the index, which we're labeling i. Although I kind of want to make it clear, right, that this is arbitrary. This is just what I, the name I'm giving. It could be anything. But conventionally, you know, i is what you give to the, the, the number of the iteration and the element. And so now what we could do is to say, like, the value um, stored at index, and I'll also show you string formatting. Right, so there's all kinds of ways to format strings. So now what we're doing is creating a little template for the string, and then we're plugging in uh, these two variables. So the, these, these, these are basically placeholders. They say insert the, var the variables that come inside this, this format call. Um, but the point is just that you know, there, there's an iterator built into Python, this enumerate thing that will give you back both the index and the element. And so often you'll need both of these things. You want to know like where exactly does the value uh, occur and what the value is. Uh, questions? Okay. This, by the way, just it's probably not clear. Uh, tuples, I mentioned that tuples are initialized with, with, with uh, parentheses, but they're actually optional. For clarity, it's a good idea to do this. So that really makes it clear that, you know, for uh, basically enumerate in, in every, in every ele for every element in random stuff is giving you back two things. Give me a tuple with two elements, i and the element. And that, I think, is clearer than this, right? It's a little hard to parse that. Like, okay, what does this mean? For i and then something else happens, but it's for every tuple in that enumerate call. Um, questions? Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, up here, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, so if we just did this, like without this stuff? No, no. If we set up uh, the, the else if, the else if, uh -huh. has put if. Oh, here? Ah, just like that. Okay, uh, so that, that's an excellent question. So, so, uh, so, does anyone else have an intuition? Like, what what would happen in this case? I mean, we can run it, but what do you think will happen? So, we know that the actual value is, uh, I think it's like 0.7. So, what am I gonna? What's gonna happen? Well, actually, just to make the point, you know, let me let me cheat a little bit. I'm gonna set this to 0.3 or 0.2. So. Um, Right. What will I actually, when I execute this, what am I going to see? Well, okay, let, let me back up. Let's take the original form. What will I see when I run this? What is it going to print? Okay, magnets are super cheap. Right. Now, it's a subtle change, right? If I just get rid of these two characters, what am I going to see when I run this? Yes, exactly. Why? Does anyone want to explain why, why that's true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, so, um, the, anything after the if is optional in Python, right? So I could comment this out. I could have just run that, and that works fine, right? It ends up printing because in this case the value is below 0.5. If it was above, nothing would happen because all the if statement is saying, it's not saying there's no else. It's just saying, you know, if the value is below 0.5, print that. If it's above, then we've said nothing. Nothing happens. Um, now, if the way we had it set up originally, this is all part of the same, the same control structure, right? So if that, what would happen, the way it's executed is if that condition is met, then it gets printed. 
An elif only gets triggered if it does not get if it does not pass. So if that fails, then elif will get called. If elif does not, if mango is is greater than one, then the next, then you know this will this will get called. If we get rid of the elif there and replace it with an if, we've basically now set up two separate control structures. Right? You can break it up, and that makes it clear. So up here we're saying, hey, if mango price is below 50 cents, print that. Independently of that, if the mango price is below one dollar, print this other thing. And so we've basically actually got two control structures, or two conditionals. Does that make sense, folks? Else, if only not comparing like the, the, the if just before it, like what if you have like so many ifs, mm -hmm. and at some point you have else if, it's going to compare only the, 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 the if just before it? Yeah so, yeah, so just think, yeah, exactly. So think of like else and elif statements as always being tied to the, the, the if statement right before them, right? So like you can have as many if statements as you want, but down here, this is always dependent on what came here. It has no concept of what happened up here. It's completely independent. Um, you know, now, this is, in some ways, you probably wouldn't want to write code this way because it's a little, um, it's a little weird, right? And the reason is because in this case, you pretty much know that if this, if something is below 0.05, you know it's also below 0.1. And so this would be a weird way to write this. You would probably want to, if you needed to do two things, you would do this, um, potentially. Or you would put, probably better be you would put it, um, well, probably what you would do actually is you would write it this way. You would say, if mango price is less than one, do that. And then beyond that, if the mango price is, just happens to be less than 0.5, um, then do this extra thing. Right? Does that make sense to folks? And this is just a slightly more efficient way. So if you're thinking like the, the efficiency of the code, now this only gets executed if the price is less than a dollar. And so you've just saved yourself because there's no reason to, to, like, to call these things twice. This will only apply, I mean, you know that if something is below 0.5, it's also below 0.1. And so you've just saved yourself a tiny little bit of code. And that seems trivial, and it is. Like, nothing would happen in this, this, this example. But when you're thinking of like working with like gigantic arrays, right, where like every little thing you do might add a little bit of computation time, this kind of like, Optimizing this kind of logic can start to be potentially important. And this is a little bit more efficient than the way we had it previously, even though it gives you exactly the same result. Um, OK, so uh, yeah, so that's a little bit of a diversion, but it's a good question. Um, any other questions about control structures? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you want to say, like, if, if the mango price is below 0.5 and, um, so it's very it's, it's easy to do. You just say it like that. So if mango is less than 0.5 and, uh, well, let's add, let's add an apple up here. Apple equals one. And apple greater one. That's it. That's all there is to it. You can also say or. And you can, you can do this arbitrarily. You know, you could have like also banana. And of course, this will start to get ambiguous. And now if I do this, now we need to talk about precedence, right? Because, um, let's see. Right, now how do you interpret this? Am I saying if the mango price is like, is this part of the same conditional and then we evaluate that, right? And so there are rules that govern precedent. So this is, there is a, a, a deterministic answer in Python. However, I would recommend anytime you start getting these kind of compound statements, just always put parentheses around stuff because that way you ensure both it's clear to the reader and also you can ensure that the interpreter will, will interpret that how you want. So you might, what you might want to mean here is if the mango price is less than 0.5 or the apple price is greater than one, and also independently of that, the banana is greater than five, do something. And that's different from this, right? So this would be a different statement. Here you'd be saying, if one of these two things is true, right? And so parentheses are your friend when you have sort of complex um, um, uh, logical statements. Um, other questions? Yeah. That's a great question, and to be honest with you, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, let me think about this. I think in this, it's, it, so it's, it's generally left to right with some exceptions. So I think this would interpret this, like this would get evaluated first, and that's an independent. Uh, I wouldn't bet money on that. Um, um, and that, so, you, so, so if you want to know the answer, I would say Google operator precedence Python, and that will tell you. Alternatively, you could just put the parentheses around and make sure that it gets evaluated the way you want. Um, there are other situations where this comes up too, where it's more important to know this. So like uh, multiplication division is a common one, right? So if I say like a, well, if I say uh, four times two divided by eight plus three, or plus one, 
right? Now, it's important to know what gets evaluated first. And in general, this is true of most languages. So generally, the precedence is multiplication, then division, then addition and subtraction. So uh, I believe it's the case that like, uh, uh, this will get evaluated, then it'll get divided by eight, and then lastly, it'll add one. If that's not what you want, then again, you have to do this. And this is true, again, in all languages. Precedence might differ slightly, but if you want to be safe, whatever language you're working in, you should always just put parentheses around, and that says group this. You might do this as one operation. Um, okay, other questions? Uh, all right, let's go on. Um, one thing I'll point out, there's, I mentioned this a little, I showed you enumerate, there's a bunch of other kinds of uh, iterators in Python. So for example, if we took our dictionary, um, if we have our, our uh, fruit prices dictionary, then there's an items iterator that gives you the key and the value as a tuple. So we can say for key val in fruit prices dot items, and now print, we can just print those two things. Okay. Um, there are also, I've already showed you this earlier, there's also a values iterator that gives you only the values as a list. There's a keys iterator that gives you only the keys. Um, and so there's, there's various ways to iterate and th those just come with experience. Like it's worth sort of familiarizing yourself with those because they can save you time. Like it's almost always the case that you can write like a naive iterator that will get you the same information. Like if I wanted both the key and the value, I could have just said uh, for key in fruit prices when you do that, if it's a dictionary, by default it's going to iterate over the keys. And so I could have said, you know, print uh, key and then fruit prices with that key that I get handed, right? So does that make sense to people? Because this is interpreted as looping over the keys and then for every key I can print that value and then use that as the, the, the key. So, uh, and the same is true for like looping over list. I could have just taken the index and used that to get the value, but there are these little shortcuts. And so it pays to know a little bit about the, the different uh, iterators that are available. Um, ah, okay, let me introduce one thing that's a little more advanced. It's really just a piece of what's called uh, syntactic sugar, meaning, um, and you know, there's, there's these kind of things in many languages. It doesn't, it's just a, like a more convenient way to write something, it's, it's just a shortcut. It doesn't actually change the meaning of what you're doing. So um, we have a loop. Let's go back to our simple loop. We have a loop, uh, random stuff, and we just want to print, right? Uh, Python lets you express this same thing, this loop, using something called a list comprehension, which is just a shortcut. It's just a shorthand way to do this, and it looks like this. Um, So the idea here is that it just sort of restructures this. So uh, up there you can see that you know, we're saying for every thing in the collection, for every, in this case for every variable we're calling element in random stuff, print, and this with inside, so this, this gives you a, a back a list, this is a list comparison that says do this, you know, r run this code, print element for element in random stuff. Um, and in many cases, this cuts down the amount of code you, you, you have to write. There's also things, you can also actually do things like this. You can actually, as a shorthand, build in an if statement. So you can essentially filter things. You can say, print the element for every element in random stuff, but only if the element value, uh, let's say, is instance, um, is a way of looking up the type of things. So we only want to print things if they're strings. And now what's happening is, for every element in that random stuff list, it first evaluates this. If it's a string, then it does this. Um, this is quite confusing at first. I remember being a little bewildered by list comprehensions. Once you get familiar, it does save you some time. But remember, you can always convert this to, I mean, this is um, what I have down there looks, ex looks exactly, or does exactly the same thing as this, right? So it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, it's just that once you've gotten used to these kind of constructs, this you often can just type much faster, and at some point it becomes easier to read too. Yeah, question? Oh, yeah, so that, the reason for that is because, yeah, so there's a subtlety here, which is that this list comprehension is returning something, and so um, it, it, it kind of comes back to the point I made earlier, right? So this is returning essentially a non-value from that, from that uh, uh, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, this is because, wait, let's see, so, oops. Yeah, so just, I mean, just to make that go away, we could have swallowed that and said, you know, like, um, ignore this. And it's just because the list comprehension always has to return a value. Um, um, but the, the actual, yeah, like, um, 
but you can still see that this gets executed. Maybe a better example would be to, like if you just wanted, so, so here's a way you can actually filter that list. Let's say that what you're trying to do is actually take only the, the, only the strings from that list and assign them to new variable, then, then you wouldn't have that problem. Um, right, so now if we do that, now that variable that gets, gets uh, returned from the list comprehension, which is the list itself, gets assigned here. So it's just like this weird case because we're printing and printing is a function that doesn't return anything and so the return value is none and so that gets assigned. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it too much. Um, typically you will use list comprehensions to do something like this. Like here what you're saying is take that random stuff list and for every element inside it, if it happens to be a string, then just return the value elem and to so give back. The, and, so that, right, and so that again is equivalent to um, well, actually, so this is interesting because here I'd have to, so the, this would actually be equivalent to um, filter strings. Uh, so just to show you an example, and this, just so you can see how much code this actually saves you. Um, There are easier ways than this, but just make it really explicit. Uh, okay, so just to kind of walk you through, right? We have a little function here. I haven't talked about functions, so I'm skipping ahead. But we have a little function that that is supposed to return only the strings in that in that um, in that list of stuff. And so we initialize an empty list where we're going to store only the strings. And then we loop over all the elements, and then for every one, we check if it's a string. If it's a string, we append it to that list and then we return that, that list of strings. This like six lines of code is equivalent to this down here. Right? And so this is why I'm saying like once you're familiar with list comprehensions, they're a very, very elegant and fast way to do more complicated things. Now I'm not gonna, I won't get into it, but there's also, you can look at map and filter, which are other ways to, um, to do this kind of filtering operation. So if you, you can go read about map and filter and those would actually be even more elegant than this actually in most cases. Um, Okay, uh, any questions about uh, control structures? Okay, I guess we have half an hour, so that's a little, let's move it. Okay, so namespaces and imports. Um, you might have noticed these weird import statements here and there, and if you're coming from R or MATLAB, these may drive you uh, crazy a little bit when you, when, you, when you sort of start working in Python. You'll see all these import statements, and it may not make a lot of sense why those are there. The reason is because Python is very serious about maintaining an orderly namespace. But what do I mean by namespace? I mean like all the, the names of variables and functions you have available, right? things that exist that you can make use of. Um, and the idea here is that you want to have like a simple uncluttered life. You don't want your namespace to have all kinds of variables and all kinds of function names that you, do, you don't remember where they came from what they do. If you actually look at the workspace when you first launch R, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there that exists for you. And that can be confusing. And it also creates conflicts often where like you call something and it turns out it's been overridden by some package you imported. And so if you ever imported a package and you have these warnings, right, like so-and-so is masked and you know, whatever, that's basically telling you that, that the R package just loaded decided to overwrite something that some other package had, had input in your workspace. And then you don't always know what it is that you're, you're using. Python's philosophy is you need to be very explicit. If you want to import or if you want to use some piece of code, um, and outside of a very, very limited set of things that are built into the language, then you need, to, you need to say that explicitly. You have to say, hey, I'm using this piece of code from this library. Even if it's in the standard library which comes with Python, you will often have to say, I explicitly want to use this piece of code. Very annoying as a beginner because you have what looks like these just extra statements you don't need, but it substantially increases code clarity. And as your code gets more complex, um, you always know where stuff is coming from and you, you, have to, you, know, you don't end up in these situations where like you have uh, generically named functions that could have come from like six different places. Was there a hand up or I thought, no. Um, so it, it eliminates naming conflict and confusion. Um, so here's what importing looks like. So I mentioned this collections module, which comes with Python and contains additional data structures beyond lists and dictionaries. And one of them is a default dictionary. Default dictionary is a dictionary that has a default value. So unlike a dictionary, so if I, uh, if I initialize a dictionary like this, so an empty dictionary, and then I say, hey, give me the value at Apple. Let me just comment this out for a moment. This will fail because there's no key. 
Now often you want a structure that doesn't show this behavior. Like you might ask for a key that doesn't exist. It shouldn't fail. It should just you know, have nothing or, or some default value. And so a default dict is basically a dictionary with a slight modification. If you ask for a key that doesn't exist, it will return a default value. And this is what you specify as a default value. In this case, we're, we're saying make the default value a list. And so when I ask for this, it doesn't exist yet, but it will return an empty list. It creates a new list. Um, that's just an aside. The main point I wanted to make here is the import statement, right? So again, out of the box, when you first launch a new environment in Python, you don't have access to default dict. It does not exist. Interpreter does know, not know what that means. If you want to use it, you have to explicitly say, hey, please import this default dict function from, or, or, from collections. Thereafter, you can use it, right? So this basically adds to your namespace this uh, name default dict, which is a chunk of code you can then invoke. Um, that's one way to import. However, you could have done exactly the same thing, but renaming this, this, uh, this module you're importing on the fly. So you might say, well, default dict is really too much to type. I don't have to keep typing default dict. So you can say import default dict, but basically alias it to DD. It's sort of like renaming it on the fly. And so this is equivalent. Uh, this points, remember, right? Variables are pointers. So this points to the same chunk of code as this here. And so when you do this, it, it should do exactly, give you exactly the same result. And alternatively, you might say, well, I don't even want to clutter up my namespace with, with things like DD and default dict. Uh, I want the minimum possible additional stuff in my workspace. So I'm just going to import collections directly. And so you import the module collections, and then you still have to sort of, then when you want default dict, you can specify that inside collections, there's this default thing, and that's what I'm using. Right? So these are all equivalent. They will all call the exact same chunk of code, which is that they'll create a new default dictionary with the default value list. And we can verify that, that the resulting objects are actually identical from all these three calls uh, by checking, evaluating that all these are identical. And the answer is yes. Okay? So this is purely stylistic. It's just a matter of what you want, what you think enhances clarity. Um, often, like when I'm writing code, if I'm going to be using lots of things from inside a module and not just one of them, then I'll usually do this, right? Because you don't want to add like 50 things to your namespace. But if I only know that I'm going to be using default dict and that's it, nothing else from collections, then I'll usually do that up there. So there's no right or wrong. It's just a case of you know, keeping track of, of your environment, and keeping it tidy. Um, but so that's the answer. If you ever wondered like, why are there all these import statements at the top when you look at a chunk of uh, like Python code? And conventionally, you put all your imports at the top so that people can look at it and know what you're using. Right? That's also very helpful. You look and you're like, oh, yes, you're using NumPy, you're using pandas, you're using default dict, and so on. Yeah? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, I'm sure the answer is yes. I don't know off the top of my head how you would do that. Well, so I mean, I, well, um, so one thing you could do is. Uh, so there are these like globals and locals which give you back um, dictionaries of everything that's currently in the in the in the scope and the environment, and then you there are ways to filter that and ask you know is this a module? Having said that, I'm sure there's there's probably like a one there's probably some so you could Google it. I'm sure there's a way to do it, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, other questions? Yeah. No, and that's exactly the point, is that if you, if you import collections, then any access to things inside collections has to be through the collections variable, so that you, you basically will only have one thing cluttering your name, namespace. Uh, you, what you could have done, if you wanted multiple things, you, know, you, you could do, um, what else is in there? You could do this, so you could import multiple things, and then each of those things would be available. Collections would not. So if, if I hadn't run these ones, and only the first one, collections would not exist in the namespace, only default dict, order dict, et cetera. So it really just think of it as a way of managing names. It's not there's no it's, it has no implications beyond that. It's just a way of how you want to keep things tidy. Yeah. So it's not a public name of error. Uh it is. Well, well it is in the sense I mean, well, depends on what you mean by problem. You can do it, right? So I could say so it's like I mean, let's demonstrate. Um, you can overwrite any variable you want. So I can say having imported collections, I can say now collections equals none. Right, and Python won't tell you anything. It won't say, "Oh, yeah, you just so you know, you just overwrote this other thing." And so now, if I um, if I print collections, we can see that. Okay. Uh, so I would have to rerun this, and now if I just reran this third cell, and so now if I again look at what this is, right. So now it tells you it's a module. Um, so in that sense, 
you, you know, there's no problem. You can always overwrite stuff. However, um, it's bad practice. So if you know that you know, you, you're going to use the collections module, you probably should steer clear of that name. And you cannot create file names in Python. You can't create modules that conflict with like, built-in things. So like, I'm fairly certain you cannot, in a Python package, create a file called collections.py. It will just ignore, it will, will not actually let you do that. Yeah? <laughs> yes. Uh, no. So there, there is a technical difference. I will say, though, that like even in the Python community, people sort of use them flexibly. So often the context will let you know what people mean. That said, a package is like a, a piece of software someone wrote. Like scikit-learn is a package, numpy is a package, like a whole bunch of code that is bundled together and released, and you would install it typically as one thing. A module is actually essentially any Python file that contains functions, variables, etc. So just think of it like the, 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 the simplest way to think about it is it's a file somewhere. Um, or equivalently, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bundle of code, could be anything, that someone decided made sense to put together. But it's not, it's just a or, loose organizational structure. And so um, collections is a module, it can have sub-modules, um, but all that means is that in the structure of that package, in this case the package would be the sort of standard library for Python, someone has decided there's a file or directory called collections, and then below that there can be you know, other modules. So a module is just a, a loose organization of code that belongs together. A package is um, what you would think of as a, thing as a software package in any other language. It's sort of a, a, like a, a thing you install that does you know, um, you know, machine learning or numerical analysis. Um, it is confusing, and if that doesn't, you know, if the distinction is not clear, don't worry about it. Usually, the context will tell you. But people, even people who have been programming for a long time, do fall into saying module when they actually mean package, or vice versa. So it's not the end of the world. Yeah. <laughs> library typically means, uh, yeah. So there's no official. There's no. A library usually means like a module. Well, so actually, library can mean either one. Library usually is used. The context is usually it's a thing you import that contains extra functionality. But it's not, there's no technical meaning beyond like it's, you know, you, so, so people will sometimes talk about collections as being a library. Um, you might talk about scikit-learn as being a library. Uh, again, these terms are fairly fluid, and the context will usually tell you what, what people mean. Um, it's not like in R, right, where like the, the function that you use to import is called library, and so that has, you know, it's like whatever you could pass to library. That doesn't technically exist here. Uh, any other questions? Okay, all right, let's move along. Um, Okay, let's talk about functions. I'm guessing I'm not going to get to uh, Jupyter Notebook, which is fine because um, uh, Elizabeth will talk all about it on, I think, either tomorrow or, or Thursday. So what's a function? Uh, a function is a block of code that only runs when explicitly called. Um, so if you have a script, right, and you just write code linearly, then every, every line is going to get executed as you go through it. But often you don't want that. You want like some chunk of code you can call repeatedly or out of order, and so you encapsulate it nicely in what's called a function. Uh, a function can take arguments or parameters that change its behavior. So you have a chunk of code, and then if it has arguments, those basically change the way that, that, that sort of modular chunk of code behaves. Uh, and it can accept in Python any number or any type of inputs, but it always returns a single object. Every pi function in Python returns a single object. Note, functions can return tuples. So sometimes it will look like, you can write a function that looks like it's returning multiple objects, but actually it's returning a tuple, right? It's just like, a, it's collecting the multiple things you're returning in one tuple. So the return value is always one object. Um, so here's an example of a, of a function, and I, I just wrote a little function that adds Gaussian noise to an input, so you pass a number, and um, mean and standard deviation for the noise distribution, and it just, all it does is it samples from the random module, it samples uh, Gaussian noise, so just somewhere in that distribution, specified by this uh, mu and standard deviation, and it returns the sum of the value added, or you passed, and this noise. So, if, right, so, so I ran that, nothing happened, why? Because that's just defining the function, it's not called. Now I can uh, actually try calling it or invoking it, so I can say, hey, take the value 7 and add noise sampled from a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation of 10. And this is, uh, this is uh, there's a random number generator involved here, right? So if, if I rerun this, it'll give me a different answer every time. It's just adding random error. Um, and so it's a function with three arguments. And notice that because these three arguments are all mandatory. So if you see something like this, 
um, and there's only the name of the argument and, and no further default value or anything, that means that it's mandatory. So I could not, like, if I tried this, it would fail. It would say, hey, you're missing one argument, right? It requires this additional positional argument, SD up here. And it's, that's because these get mapped one to one. So when I call add noise, the value seven gets mapped onto the X, zero gets mapped to the mu, and then I'm missing a mandatory third argument, and so it fails. Um, whereas this works fine. Okay, so uh, the function in Python. Uh, remember, I mentioned that you, you know you, you you could so I could do something like this. I could say maybe maybe I want to return the success status. So I think you know if, I, if you got this far, that means that you succeeded in sampling error. So return both status true and the actual value. And you might think, oh look, it looks like you're returning multiple values, but I'm not. This is actually returning a tuple, and to make that explicit, I could do this, right? So again, only one, one value is ever returned from a function in Python. Um, but it could be a, anything you want. It could be a list, it could be a dictionary, it could be an arbitrarily complex structure. Um, okay, now, there's a distinction between positional and keyword arguments. Python has um, um, uh, or optional arguments. Um, so, I mentioned already the positional arguments are defined by the position, they must be passed, but you also have keyword arguments where you specify a default value. So here, we have one positional argument, x, and we have two keyword arguments that have a default value. And that's really nice because it means that now the user does not have to supply these, right? So it says if you don't get a, a value from mu or sd from the user, use this default value. And that makes life much easier because it means the user doesn't have to type um, like, let's say I only ever want to add noise sampled from a normal distribution with mean zero SD1, uh, then I can just do add noise with defaults 10, right? And this will always add noise sampled from these values here. But I can still override these by saying, um, you know, something else. And in fact, one thing that's nice about, um, one thing that's nice about uh, uh, keyword arguments is they can come out of order. They always have to come after the positional arguments. So if there are any positional arguments, X always has to come first. But let's say that I want to keep, you know, my, like I'm okay with the default value for the mean of zero, but I don't want the standard deviation to be one. I want it to be 10. So I can just say that. And so what will happen now is instead of getting mapped in order, so this 10 will still get mapped to the X, but this SD, because I'm naming it, right, will get mapped because the name matches onto this value. So it'll still have mu set to zero as the default, but now, um, and this is super helpful because many functions, particularly when you get into things like, uh, you think of like a package like scikit-learn, which we'll talk about tomorrow, where you can have some estimators that have all kinds of parameters, right? There's like potentially like 20 different uh, arguments or parameters that you can modify. It would be really awful if you had to write like all of them out every single time, even you know, just to set the default value. And so that allows you to ignore all of the arguments that you don't want to change. You're happy with the default value and just pass the one you care about. So maybe in this case, well in this case I'm saying, I'm fine with the default value from you, I'm just changing the standard deviation. So this is, uh, it, it's really nice. It makes the language quite flexible. And there are many languages where you would have to actually call the exact same signature, right? So you'd have to call every single one of the arguments, even if you're, you know, uh, you, you don't want to, I mean, you're not trying to actually change the behavior in any meaningful way. Uh, questions? Okay. Uh, this is a slightly more advanced um, uh, uh, concept. Um, so maybe there's probably people in the room for who this is sort of all review or you know, basic stuff. Um, you might not have seen this before, this actually, let me just, oh, interesting, I guess this is, so it's interpreting this as uh, italics, that's why, you know, so, um, oops. Um, so you have these args in, in keyword args, or KW args things, what, is, what did those do? You might have seen these in, in, in uh, Python functions sometimes, um, so like here's an example, right, what, what does this mean? Like why would you have these funny asterisks before the args in, in KW args? Well, sometimes functions need to accept, or at least it's helpful to accept, arbitrary or unknown arguments. So, I mean, here's a trivial case. Let's say that I want, this would be a weird thing to do, but I want a function that just prints all the arguments it receives. But it doesn't constrain you. It doesn't say, hey, there has to be an argument named x, or there's only three arguments. Basically, I want a function that you can hand whatever you want, and it will print it, right, without having to specify in advance what those arguments are. And so the idea here is that you have these two conventions, star args, 
captures all of the variables that, or all of the arguments that don't otherwise have explicit specification in that signature in a list called args. And KW args captures all um, named variables or keyword variables, right? So if I pass in the, the function call apple equals three, then those will get added as key value pairs to this KW args dictionary. Now the names are purely conventional. You could, like this doesn't have to be args and, and KW args, you could call it whatever you want. It's just a convention so that when you're reading someone's code, you understand what's happening here. You say like, oh yes, this is capturing all these extra arguments. Okay, this is pretty abstract, might not make a whole lot of sense. Let's see what happens when we actually do this, right? So um, if I, well, let me first, let me first show you what happens if I were to call this add noise thing with arguments that it doesn't know about. Like let's say I, I have like, I don't know, I think, I, I mistakenly believe that, that add noise is using a beta distribution. Um, so, uh, you know, um, let's say I pass the parameter b equals one and add noise is gonna complain because it doesn't know what that means, right? So it has a fixed, it says like, these are the arguments I'm expecting. The value, x, mu, and standard deviation. In this case up here, you have these things which are sort of, which are explicitly gonna capture anything that's not otherwise mentioned. So if I were to call this now, and I say, I call print args and kw args, and I say, uh, you know, beta equals 100, no problem, it doesn't complain. Why, well what's happening is, think of it this way, think of this as like you're passing a message. When you call this function, you're saying, hey, function, take this keyword argument. The key is beta and the value is 100. Okay, what happens here is this thing looks at its, its signature here and says, well, I don't have any, any very, like, you know, I, there's nothing called, there's no argument called beta like this. So ordinarily I wouldn't know what to do with this, but since you helpfully told me to store all the key value pairs in this keyword arguments thing, I'm just gonna add that to this dictionary. And so now beta is the key, is a key in, in this key, keyword args dictionary, and the value is gonna be 100. And so when I print this down here, that's exactly what it does. I could also have passed a positional argument. I could have said um, uh, just the string mu, okay? Any intuitions about what's gonna happen now? Where's that gonna show up? So what we'll, what we'll print now? So args is a list. And so what'll happen here is, so what happens again, think of, of this as like trying to interpret it, the input it gets. It gets a string mu, and normally these would be mapped one to one onto positional arguments. But in this case, we don't have, we haven't specified any positional arguments. If we'd said this, then that mu would be stored in x. But in this case, we don't have anything to capture that. And so it ends up in this, in this args list, which captures all of, the, all of the positional arguments that don't have any other specification. And so then we print it, it just prints that back to us. <laughs> ah, well, interesting. It, it is important, you're right, but actually there's, so let's try that, right? Um, you might think that the order, may, oh, so now this is gonna get stored in keyword args, but actually this will just fail. And the reason is because you cannot pass a positional argument after a keyword argument. So, um, so in this case, it's always the case that if you, if you pass, now, what, you, what you're saying is right in the sense that if you did this, so let's take this as an example. Um, so let's say we do have, our argument does have one uh, variable called x. Now order's gonna matter, right? Because if I call this, mu is gonna get stored in x, and then this other value four that has nowhere to go is gonna get stored in args. So we should expect to see four printed. Uh, it's, that's interesting. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't rerun the, the function. So I was using the old function, there we go. Uh, okay, right, so, so mu now gets swallowed by x and it's a sign there, but, but this has nowhere to go, so it gets stuck in args. If I'd reverse these, then now x is gonna have value four and mu is gonna get stored in that, that um, Basically, think of args as keyword arguments as sort of like, like the, you know, uh, the place where all the lonely variables go, right? They're not explicitly specified and just collects them and you can, you can use them later. Now you might say, well, why, why would you want this, right? This is, what could you do with this? It turns out to be really helpful. There's actually many situations in which you know that you're gonna get a bunch of arguments, but you don't know what those arguments are. You wanna use that carefully because, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. It's helpful to name the arguments explicitly and it, makes, it reduces probability of error, but there are lots of situations, I won't talk about them, where this is actually extremely powerful and lets you write code that can do really, really flexible things uh, because you know that you're always gonna be able to accept arbitrary arguments and use them in, in some way. 
Um, and then, you, well, just to show you a simple example, um, you know, then I can start doing things like, um, uh, let's say, um, let's say that beta is one of the things that could be passed but doesn't have to be. So I can say beta equals keyword args get um, beta. And what does this say? This is basically saying, um, take that keyword args dictionary. This is true of any dictionary. If you call get on the dictionary, it'll check for the key beta. And if it doesn't find that key, it won't fail, which a dictionary would do normally. It will return this default value. And so now I've written a function where if the user happens to pass a beta argument, uh, oh, whoops, let me get rid of this args, x, right? If it ha the user happens to pass um, the, the, a beta argument, then we can make use of that. We can basically check and say, hey, was there a, an, an argument called beta passed? But if not, nothing bad would happen, right? So, so um, it would still internally assign a, a value. Um, this stuff can, you know, it, it gets hairy pretty quickly. But it, I just, even if that doesn't quite make sense, the thing I want you to get out of this is the sense that this is it's, it's a super flexible language and it has a lot of expressive power. So you can uh, do really quite powerful things using some of these uh, more advanced language constructs. Um, okay, the last thing, I'll, and I'll stop. I'm happy to, to finish and talk about other stuff I didn't get to at, at any point next week. Feel free to grab me and, and I'm happy to talk about this. Uh, our classes. So this is one thing that you might not have encountered depending on what, what, what languages uh, or environments you're coming from. Um, it's object-oriented programming. A class you can think of as a template for an object. It's a way of defining um, a, 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 an object. And so class, a class defines the variables an object contains and what it can do with them. And so just to illustrate, let's define a circle class. So we're basically introducing to Python a completely new type of thing called a circle. Um, now, I will say, I mean, I know this is true of some of the things I've talked about, but if you haven't seen object-oriented programming before, it can be quite hard to follow. And this is, don't feel at all bad. Actually, this is true of everything I've said. But like, if this, if this doesn't immediately make sense to you, that's fine, right? I remember when I was taking intro CS, it took me a few weeks to wrap my head around like, you know, object, so don't feel bad if, if, if you don't get it right away. It, it, you should feel really good about yourself if you haven't seen it before and you do get it right away. Um, um, so what's happening here is we're defining, so I, I just left a placeholder. We're basically writing a, a definition of an object. We're saying it would be really useful for us if we had a type of thing called a circle that we could instantiate. So we can create circles ad hoc as we need them. And here's the template for doing that. So um, um, we, we have this init method, which is magic. I won't talk about it. I won't explain what it does. It's just it's a, it's a constructor, meaning when you create a new circle, this init method is going to get invoked always. That's just sort of um, how Python is. Um, and let's say that when we create a circle, we want to pass in the radius of a circle. So we can say that there's this argument um, radius, let's say it's mandatory, there's no default value. I won't explain why self is the first argument, but inside objects it always is. Ask me afterwards because I'm going to run out of time otherwise and I'm happy to explain it. Um, we'll store that inside, so we'll just say that when you, the circle is initialized, you pass a radius and it stores this radius internally for later use. And let's say that one of the things we want a circle to be able to do is tell you what the area of that circle is. Uh, so of course you all know how to compute the area of a circle from its radius, right? Um, uh, pi r squared. So when someone calls area, we will just return the radius, which is stored internally, uh, times, uh, oops, sorry, uh, times radius squared. Okay. Um, let me, I'll skip this copy thing, just in the interest of time. So we, we just, this is a very, this is a kind of a silly example. We have a, we're defining an object called a circle that we can instantiate and then we can get its, its, uh, its, uh, its area. So now we want to create a circle. Let's say we want a circle with radius four. So we'll call it circle. This is arbitrary, call, call it C, whatever you want, right? Uh, circle, and it's a, it's a instance of class circle. So circle is a definition, it's an abstract definition. It's like saying this defines what a table is, but now we actually want to create a table or a circle in our case. And remember, it has this initialization parameter radius, so we will initialize it with a radius of, of four, done. Nothing happens because we haven't asked to do anything beyond that. Uh, but remember, we implemented the ability to, to compute area. Now if we want to print the circle's radius, 
we can take the circle that we just created, that we instantiated, I should say, and we can say, hey, call the, the, the method or function area, and there it is, right? So when you call this, um, that instance of class circle that we called circle, let's call this, uh, just to be very explicit, let's call this circle one, right? Oops. And we can ask for its area. Now, you might say, well, why bother having a class for this? You could have just written a little function that takes an argument, its radius, and returns a, 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 the area. Yes, but we might want to build up on this circle and have it do all kinds of other stuff, and we don't want to have a function that does you know, all kinds of things. We're sort of modularizing things nicely. So um, why this might matter is let's say we had another circle we needed to keep track of, and this one has a radius of 10, or let's say 20. Right? So now we can create these two separate circles, and at any point we could ask them for their area. And these will be different, because internally they're storing a different radius. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of object-oriented programming in a very, 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 very small nutshell. There's a lot more to it than that. And again, this might not make a whole lot of sense. But the key point I want to make here, and the thing to take away from this is, everything in Python, integers, dictionaries, et cetera, all have a class definition of this kind. There is some code somewhere deep in, in you know, the internals of Python, and most of it actually is written in C, not in Python for speed. But there is something that looks you know, vaguely like this inside, and there is a class called you know, integer, like this, or int, that would define everything an integer does. And the last thing I want to get to, because this is, I think I'll skip this, uh, are magic methods, which I think are super cool. Again, um, this is a little more advanced, so don't worry if this doesn't make sense right away. Um, but if it does, I think you'll get some, some useful insight into, into how Python works. Um, you've seen these magic methods, these things with like double underscore the beginning and end, a couple of times now, like you just saw init in the class definition. Um, these are methods that belong to classes or, or to objects that have a special meaning. Right? Python is assigned in the language they're defined as having some special role. They're not just like random functions that you could write yourself. Um, it turns out that all operators in Python, by which I mean things like you know, greater than, multiply, like any, you know, all these symbols, these operators that you might think of as sort of built into the language, um, in other languages might be, right? There might be some are defined, like division is a, is a special thing and, and always does the same. It only works on numbers and it's defined somewhere at the core of the language. But in Python, all operators are actually just cleverly designed, uh, disguised method calls. So actually, when you call code like age in years times two, what you're actually doing, right? Under the hood, this is actually, it, it, this object age in years is receiving a message and that mapping, so in, inside Python, this symbol, this multiplication symbol is actually mapped to this special magic method underscore underscore mole underscore underscore and then everything after this is, is passes the argument. Right? So why is this interesting? Um, it is really interesting and really powerful because it means that any object that implements this method can use the multiplication operator. And that opens the door to some really interesting things. So now let's go back to our, our circle, last thing I'll show you, uh, circle definition, and we're going to add that. We're going to say, um, um, let's add multiplication. What is reasonable behavior for multiplication, well, we might want to take a circle, and if you multiply by two, that means you want to multiply its radius. And it should return you a new, a new circle with a radius multiplied by two. So um, multiplication takes one other argument, which is the operand on the, on the other side, right? So um, what we're going to do here is return a new circle with radius, that is the, in, the internally stored radius multiplied by two. So this looks kind of magical. And, and it is, now it just that, that, those two lines of code, what that means is now, now I can initialize a new circle with radius three, four, can't type threes. Um, and let's say I want to create a, a new circle. Um, I can now multiply this by, you know, let's say two. Uh, for what oops, what I do? Oh, I'm sorry. This should be other, not yeah. Uh, yeah. Huh. 
this is why you you uh, you don't leave a year between executions of the notebook. Um, I am doing something fairly stupid here, I'm sure. Um, self other. Let's consult Google. So if you want to know what all the, the function names for the operators are, uh, you can always look those up. Oh, OK, so OK. Um, my bad, right? It needs both of the, wait, no. Oh, yes, sorry, thank you. Yes, good catch. Yeah, so, and that's actually a good thing to point out, right? So like every time I run the cell, of course, it, it, it you know, would run that code, but since in this case I had to find a new class called integer, it, it would have worked if I had actually called this integer, but yeah, thank you for that. Um, so there was actually nothing wrong with that except for the fact that I was setting a different class. Okay, so now uh, if we do this, um, so now we can, let's see. So we initialize a new circle, now we can say, take that first circle multiplied by two, and now we can ask for the radius of that second circle, and that is actually the correct area for a circle with radius eight, not four, right? So the kind of the overarching point here is, everything in Python is an object, and you can actually do really, really powerful things with the language by overriding, or by implementing these sort of magical methods that have all kinds of meaning. So you can, you can actually, Python is a really nice language for building what are called domain-specific languages. You can create essentially a mini language that does all kinds of very powerful things by implementing uh, these operators and giving them whatever semantics you want. And so one thing that, that uh, when, I, when I talk about, sort of I have a, a, another presentation where I talk about more advanced things, and the example I give there is you could take like a library like NiBabel, which is an image manipulation library for Python, and I think it would actually be a really nice thing to do if someone wants a project for, for next week, would be to actually implement this kind of semantics for, for uh, brain images. So that if you, you can imagine doing things like uh, image one um, and image two, and that gives you the, the conjunction of the actual images. Right? This would be actually totally doable in Python to implement a, a mini language in some sense, where this is an, a NiBabel image object, and this is two, and then when you use this operator, it just says, hey, take the, the two maps and just take only the values that occur in both maps. So you could, you could come up with all kinds of um, really powerful sort of syntaxes for doing uh, all kinds of interesting things. Um, and so, don't, so you can think of Python as like a static language and it's very powerful, but once you kind of understand a little bit about the internals, then it really opens the door to doing all kinds of really, really cool things. 